Good morning, everyone. It's uh, nice to see Chris back and with uh, the wonderful and much publicized Bow Fiddle Rock in the background. Um, welcome to everyone. We have uh, good attendance today. Two or three stragglers not quite yet here, but we'll, we'll kick off in a minute. So thank you very much again for your time. Sorry you find me at home today. I'm waiting for contractors. Uh, Paul seems to suggest it's sunny in Forest. Now, I live a couple of streets away from Paul and it's not sunny out of my window, so I think he's lying. Um, this is the second of four webinars, workshop events with uh, our friend Chris here. Um, this, this one is the one I've been looking forward to most in an odd sort of way, because um, I think there's lots that we can take out of it and potentially helps us to start having a different conversation about how we manage our uh, accommodation inventory and how we sell our how we sell our accommodation, our attractions, um, and ultimately our region. So uh, that's enough for me today because I can prattle on. Thank you very much again for all of you, all of your time. I think today's uh, today's workshop will take a little bit longer, uh, but she, Chris assures me that he doesn't prattle on as long as I do. So um, that's it for me. Three, two, one, switching off and muting and going to Chris. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can all see my screen okay. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to delivering this workshop. So for those who missed me last time, my name is Chris Torres. Uh, I run the Tourism Marketing Agency based out of Glasgow. Um, we, we predominantly deal with um, tour operators. We do have a, a couple of accommodation providers, et cetera, who we help market. Um, but most of our companies that we help market, like I say, are tour operators. But the premise and the, uh, the advice I'm going to give works for uh, pretty much any type of tourism business. And uh, our, my own business, actually about 90% of it works with uh, international markets. We do have some customers in Scotland and the UK, um, but then a, a large bulk of that is international. So what this gives us is a good indication of how different destinations work, how different destinations buy in terms of the customers. So knowing how a customer from America buys products in Scotland is very different from someone in Germany, for example. So we have a lot of that knowledge here in-house and I hopefully share some of that with you today. Um, so there's a couple of things that we're going to cover quite a few things in this workshop. So I hope you, ha hope you have some notes, a notepad and pen. Um, and uh, we'll try to go through, it's, we have two hours booked, but what we'll try to do is go through it as, as quickly as we can, but not too fast so you don't understand and leave enough time at the end. So you guys may have some questions. I'll be here to answer them, uh, whether it's about this or any other uh, part of marketing. So let's start with um, what you will learn. Uh, in this uh, workshop. Main thing is why direct, direct bookings matter. Um, we're going to look at the strengths and the pitfalls of using an online travel agent, an OTA. And for those who do not know what an OTA is, it's companies like TripAdvisor, Booking.com, Get Your Guide. Uh, these sort of, for once of a better word, glorified directories that help sell your products. So that is what an OTA is. And we're going to look at, like I say, the strengths and pitfalls of each one. Um, why I think, and why even more so now than ever, direct bookings really matter. And I'll give you my thoughts. And, and one little caveat I will add to this is, is I'm not against OTAs uh, at all. I do think they do certain things I'm, I, I, I'm not happy with. Uh, and, and I think too many operators and too many uh, accommodation businesses and travel businesses rely too heavily on them, and we'll touch on that later. But ultimately, for, to grow your business, direct bookings is what really matters, uh, and we'll, I'll tell you why uh, shortly. We're also going to look at, just briefly touch on some of Google, Google's recent movements in travel and what this means for you. Um, there are certain things that Google have been doing um, that, for my opinion, help local businesses, businesses like yourselves, direct market to your customers. Um, and they're trying to, OTAs aren't really happy with them, um, and, and which I'm, I, I, I can see why. But ultimately, my job in my last 14 years of, of running TMA uh, has been making sure that travel businesses grow their own business and grow those direct channels. I don't care about the OTAs, I care about you guys, basically. So um, so we're going to show you highlight what Google are doing, which can help benefit with that as well. 
Uh, and we're also going to touch upon and show you some information on how to create a lead generation, a lead generating website, sorry, that does not cost the earth. Now, I, I'm covering this because this has a big, you know, websites is obviously a big part of direct bookings, um, a huge part of it. It's usually the first place that people go to. Um, but a lot of people, especially in Scotland, I have found that a lot of businesses don't have their own website. They rely on the booking.coms, the TripAdvisors, etc. They may have a Facebook page, they may have a one-page website, but, but don't even have any, have any online booking, which is, which is huge, especially now. And if you were in my last workshop, you, you, you may have heard me saying, now more than ever, people are going to book online. We could initially be seeing the death of paper money, of coins, because people don't want to pass that around and because of COVID or anything else. That, that's going to become less and less. And we're already seeing that in some shops and various other places that will only accept contactless payments, that type of thing. And there's going to, that's only going to become more commonplace. Uh, and, and what we're finding is, especially with the older markets, uh, as I mentioned in the last workshop, is they are getting the older market, and in terms of that, I mean like 60 plus, they're becoming more confident in using contactless payments or booking online or buying the shop online, that type of thing. So there's going to be more and more online payments happening because of what's going on in the world. Um, so online booking is going to be hugely important. So we're going to cover the website side of things as well. I'm going to prove to you that you don't need to spend hundreds and thousands of pounds on a website. You can do it for well, you, you'll see what we can do it for. I think you'll be shocked in terms of uh, how you can create your own website for this. But there's a, but again, direct bookings. There is an initial problem that any tourism business have has, and it's this. There's so much choice out there. Um, no, what do customers pick at the end of the day? And you're only going to attract your customers if you show your unique selling points, if you show you why your experience is better than anyone else's, uh, why you are excellent at what you do. Um, and you have to get that communication across. Using online travel agents, using any other platform that helps sell your products will not do that. You can only do this directly. Uh, and we're going to touch on that as well. So ultimately, consumers have too much choice. Um, you can look at this as brand clutter uh, in terms of the amount of choice that people have. You can also, uh, this image also includes marketing clutter. It's getting through and getting your message through to the right customer at the right time and making sure that your brand stands out. Uh, and there's a little uh, thing that I say, and, and there's a little truth, um, in my opinion, it's behind all this, and is that you should not run a tourism business uh, I know that might seem strange, but in my opinion, whether it doesn't matter if, uh, if whether it's tourism or not, whatever the main focus of that business is, do not run your business as a tourism business. Run it as a media company. You have to have the mindset of becoming a media company to get across your message, to actively focus your marketing uh, and get enough marketing and enough collateral out there to drive those direct bookings. And I know that will be hard for some businesses, but ultimately, this is what you need to do in today's digital world. Because when you actually look at the amount of choice that we have out there, it is incredible. Now, becoming a media company involves putting out meaningful content about your, your niche uh, to drive direct traffic to your website or other marketing channels. So that is ultimately what you're trying to do. You're trying to get as, much, as many eyeballs on your brand, on your website, on your product, as much as possible so and that is what an effective marketing campaign can do and you don't need to sp spend the earth on on doing marketing there's a lot of free things that you could be doing right now um, and we'll touch upon that later but this is what you have to be you have to become that media company if you want to stand out um, and again the battle between the otas and yourself and everything else we'll touch on this why this is important but ultimately you know you've You've got so many different facets that you have to focus on, whether that's writing blog posts, whether that's doing Facebook or Google ads or creating your brochures or looking at SEO or video or running events or all the different things that you have to do to market your business. And this is just a small selection. Um, so this is why you have to have that media company mindset. Now, you don't need to do everything that's displayed here, but as long as you do a few of them and you do them well, you will be seen and you will be noticed and you will stand out. Um, and we'll touch on that uh, again a little later. Because basically what you want to do 
to turn that into this and let people know we're here, drown out everyone else and get people to come to you. So have that mindset of becoming a media company that just happens to sell a tourism product. So just have that in your mindset when you, when you go forward in, in your own marketing efforts. But the main part of, of this workshop we want to discuss is a question I, I always get asked in, in terms of any events that I do, any webinars I do in my day-to-day -day job is OTA or direct. What is the best method to drive bookings for a business? And the answer I always give is, is finding the right balance between using an OTA and using direct. Unfortunately, too many businesses rely heavily on OTAs, um, which we'll touch on shortly. But the only way you can really grow your business is to, like say, focus more on the direct, but don't forget about the online travel agents. They do play an important role. Um, but again, far too many businesses just rely that a little bit too heavily on them. And, and what you tend to find is a lot of businesses rely on maybe one or two OTAs at the very most. Um, if you are going to use online travel agents, you have to spread your, 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 your listings out across multiple different platforms. No, you should be using five, six, seven OTAs that can help drive bookings to your business. So you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Um, but then with everything that's going on in the world, OTAs aren't really selling much at the moment because people aren't really going there. They can't really book. OTAs don't really have a focus on uh, direct, uh, sorry, local and domestic travel, which is the main focus for the next 18 months, if, if you heard my workshop before uh, and last week. So, but they will be changing to this, and we'll come on to that in a second. But that's why direct is, is more important at the moment. So a couple of slides that I showed um, in the last one, just to highlight why direct bookings uh, is important at the moment. Now, this is aimed at tour operators, but it's the same for pretty much any travel business going forward. About 86% of tourism activity sector, for example, sell under 192,000 annually. So most businesses are small. They make less than 200 grand a year, um, probably a lot lower than that in some cases. So the, the amount of money that you have to play with in terms of commissions, in terms of marketing, in terms of all these other things, is going to be limited. But it's maybe not quite as limited as you think in terms of direct channels. So have that mind, have this in your mind that roughly 192,000 is the average sort of uh, annual revenue or turnover generated by a tourism business. But then we've got the added impact of, and again, the slide it was from last week, of flights being severely hit. No international travel has been severely hit. I actually think the number is bigger than this, to be honest, but when this uh, was conducted by the IATA, up to 55% of international travelers, uh, there's gonna be a reduction of that for the whole of 2020. That's nearly 300 million passengers lost. Uh, and you can see there the, the 314 billion US dollars lost uh, worldwide. So, and I think that number's conservative, to be honest. So. Not only do we have COVID, not only do we have a reduction in international travel, we've got other things that are happening all over the world. It's stopping bookings from happening, local lockdowns, local things that are all, all going on. So this is why you really have to push for those sort of local and domestic market because we won't be able to go anywhere else. We can only travel within our own country, basically. So this is why you need to focus on them, as I mentioned in the last talk. But for the last five months, and this is where a lot of, of this workshop has been driven from. Uh, for the last five months, I actually, as soon as COVID hit, I could see what was going to happen. And I basically opened up my diary uh, and I spoke to over 80 tourism businesses worldwide. I basically opened, I, I provided an hour free consultation to speak to them, find out where they are, give them some advice on how they could pivot their business to focus on different areas giving them a lot of advice in terms of the local markets, what they should be focusing on, or give them inspiration of what they could be focusing on. Um, but what I, found was, what I found during those conversations was, one, it was inspiring to see how many businesses were trying to cope and trying to pivot their business to, to get through this. But it was also heartbreaking to see, well, I had some, some business owners that were breaking down in tears in the call with me, because they, they, they they could just see that their business was going to close. They could see the business was going to fail. Um, but it really was 
from my own event, just from a personal point of view, it was it was really an eye opener. It was really, and, and it's why I, I I try to offer as much free marketing advice and put that out there as possible because I know everyone's hurting. I know the industry is literally on its knees at the moment, and we want to try and do everything to make sure that our, our tourism industry survives. And we have to do that, and it will survive, but it will survive from a different guise. Um, but again, by doing all these consultations, allow me to do that. Um, but what became really clear um, was the ones that I spoke to who were heavily reliant on the OTAs were the worst affected because of COVID. Um, and it doesn't need to be COVID. It could be any crisis. It could be another volcano erupting in Iceland. It could be a terrorist attack. It just happens to be COVID at this moment in time. So there's a few issues when you rely heavily on OTAs. When I mean heavily rely on OTAs, though, some of these businesses that I spoke to were 50%, 70%, or even 100% reliant on an online travel agent, which you should never do in a business. If, if you're happy doing that and you just want to sit back and see some bookings coming in, which obviously isn't going to happen just now, and you're not really bothered about building a brand and building a business, you're just wanting to have that money come in, that's fine. And if that's what you want, completely fine. But if you're there to try and grow your business and have something you can say, this is my business, this is my brand, something you could sell or pass on uh, at a later stage, you can't really do that if you're 100% reliant on an OTA because technically you don't have a business and we'll come on to that in a second. So, but those who were heavily reliant on OTAs were the worst hit. Um, and there's a few reasons why. Uh, one of them is because you're not in charge of your cancellation policies and you're not in charge of your refunds. So typically what happens when COVID hit, uh, a lot of the tours had to get canceled because of, uh, or, or accommodation providers or whatever had to get canceled because of the lockdowns, because of the restrictions, especially at the start of COVID. So as soon as that happens, the OTAs refund the money and give that back to the customers, which is, uh, which is the right thing to do, don't get me wrong. But that is not giving you as a business the opportunity to try and persuade that customer to postpone to a later date uh, so you're able to keep that deposit or keep that money to make sure that you survive uh, and hopefully get them on to provide that product or service that you provide in 2021 for example so you know, we have a, a client in ireland uh, called overland Ireland. so what they managed to do is they, they provide sorry multi-day tours in ireland um, and they predominantly, as you can imagine with Ireland, rely heavily on the international markets, but specifically the American market. And it's a huge one for them. And the no, American market's big for Scotland as well, but even more so for, for Ireland because of the connections between Ireland and, and America, for example. They managed to have a strong direct channel. They managed to defer 95% of their sales to next year. So they managed to keep all their bookings, keep all the deposits, 95% of them until 2021 and provide new dates. Though things might change, we don't know what's going to happen with COVID, but to, to, it's a testament to their team and having that direct relationship with their customer that they managed to defer 95% of their bookings. You cannot do that if you're so heavily reliant on an OTA. So that's one benefit of not heavily relying on an OTA. And it's a testament to, to the owner, it's a testament to their sales team that they've managed to do that. And they're not the only one. Many businesses out there have managed to do similar things. I know one, one other business who has managed to defer 65% of the bookings and that can make the difference of your business surviving or not. So again, if you're using an online travel agent, you're not in charge of your cancellation policies or refunds. You also do not own especially initially, your customer's data. So if someone books through TripAdvisor, Booking.com, that type of thing, they, the, the online travel agent owns the data. Some online, online travel agents don't provide you that data until that customer has taken out the tour or taken out your accommodation or whatever your product happens to be. So you do not get those, that information till later. So you can't go back to them and say, look, I would like to postpone, would you like to postpone, would you like to defer till next year, that type of thing. And ultimately, if you do not own your customer's data, 
you do not have a business either because you have nothing there to market to. You have no customer to speak of really because it is not your customer. It's a TripAdvisor's customer. It's a booking.com customer. And it's one of the reasons why we've seen a rise in companies who provide digital waivers because it's a way of getting your customer's details to, to you, so you can collect that information and keep that data for your own marketing, your own CRM systems, that type of thing. So and that's one way of getting around it is by providing your customer a digital waiver for them to sign and fill out the details and get them to, so they provide that information to you. So you do not own your customer's data. And that's one thing that's the downside of using an online travel agent. But on another fact, uh, and this is an ongoing one in the moment, I know of one OTA, I won't mention them here, but I know of one OTA that the way their refunds work, and I know they have changed this now over the last couple of weeks, but they're still got the issue, is that they uh, had to refund, um, or they took the, the onus of refunding your customers, um, the customers of the operators, the customers of the accommodation providers, etc. So they took that money from the operator, from the business, basically like your business, because they, they take all the money up front uh, and pay that direct to you. So they took that back from you, um, but they have still yet to refund their customers. So the people who actually bought the products from the operators, the accommodation providers, et cetera, have still six months down the line not received their refunds, or for some of them anyway, or, or a large proportion of them. That is ridiculous. Um, it's putting, uh, although they bought through an online travel agent, if they see that it's actually your business is providing that, your business will be the one suffering in terms of brand trust from that, as well as the OTA, don't get me wrong, but you will also suffer in that because they will blame you for not getting a refund. So it's something to think about depending on the OTAs. Look at how they handle refunds. Look at how they handle paying you, et cetera, because a lot of OTAs, will not pay an operator for weeks down the line or until a product has been delivered, that type of thing, which, is, which I can understand why, because of cancellations, because of multitude of different things. I know it doesn't help tourism businesses, but I can see why OTAs do it. But ultimately, this one did pay the operators uh, and the tourism businesses, but took the money back and has yet to refund the customers. So it's a double-edged sword. So. Just be careful if you are using OTAs, how they handle that and make sure that you are covered and you're not going to have any fallback on you. So that's I just that's one I needed to highlight as well, just to be certain. The other aspect is, is your brand is not on show. Theirs is no. When someone goes to book a product on TripAdvisor, they think it's a TripAdvisor product. When someone goes to book a product on Booking.com, they think it's a Booking.com product, or for the most part. That your brand is not sure their brand is being promoted. So if you're wanting to grow your brand, if you're wanting to grow your business, you're not going to do that effectively through an online travel agent or any other partner that doesn't really get across your brand in the right and proper way. So if you are, if that is an important aspect to you and you want to have a, a business that you know is yours and, and you can grow that, you're not going to do that if you're really heavily reliant on those OTAs, as I mentioned earlier on. The OTA is also gaining the trust and the awareness, not you. So if you deliver a great experience, likelihood is, is that same customer isn't going to come back and book direct with you. They're going to come back and book again through TripAdvisor, through Booking.com, because they, they feel the confidence has been gained through those platforms. So again, building up trust in your own business and what you do, is not really going to happen to the same extent if you were booking direct when all the brand trust and all the awareness is, is focused on you. So again, using heavily reliance on, on OTAs, if you're 50, 60, 70, 100% reliant, you're not going to get, gain this trust or awareness anywhere close as you would do on uh, getting a direct booking. We're already now seeing, and it'll happen a few years back, but I'm sure other online travel agents will follow suit Get Your Guide, big online travel agents, in fact, one of the, the biggest, launched Get Your Guide Originals. They have launched their own tours and they now, which have branded up Get Your Guide Originals. Uh, so they're now competing with other tourism businesses, competing direct with you. This is more so for the tour operators, but they are now, for experiences, I'm sure accommodation providers and everything else, this will all happen in time and probably has happened for some online travel agents. 
this is what's going to happen. This, they're going to start providing their own products and then they're going to start competing with you in some of the areas that you may be working in. So again, let's just have a look. It's, 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 OTAs have been given so much funding. They have so many shareholders. They need to claw that money back to pay those shareholders, especially now with everything that's going on. So being able to generate other ways of generating revenue, all the OTAs are looking at how they can do that. And this is one of them. Get Your Guide is launching their own products with their own guides that are going to compete against other tourism businesses. So it's something to look out for as well. As if it wasn't already difficult for a lot of, a lot of you guys, um, this is what a lot of the OTAs are starting to do. Another big OTA, which happens to be in the same group as TripAdvisor, Viator, uh, they now charge, and this happened only last month. So even with COVID going on, they now introduced a charge of $29. It doesn't seem a lot, but this is $29 every time you upload a new product for what they call quality control. Um, now, this is something they should have been doing anyway. Um, but without, but they've realized they've just put so many tours and so many products uh, on their platform that they now see an issue because there's too much, forgive, forgive the sort of analogy here, but too much dross on there. Um, so they're now taking a lot of that off um, and uh, they are basically trying to quality control, which is the right thing to do, but, being able, but charging every tourism business to do so for every single listing. So every time you make a change or upload a new product or whatever that would be, you get charged $29 for them to check. So you're already paying a lot of these guys a high commission. So in my opinion, this is the wrong way to do it, especially now with COVID. An extra fee that nobody really needs at the moment isn't the right way to do it. But again, they hold the cards. If you're reliant on these guys, they can basically charge whatever they want. Uh, so you do have to think about these things as well. From my opinion, and the opinion of many others, companies like TripAdvisor, who were initially offering impartial reviews, are no longer impartial, in my opinion, or an independent review system. Why? Well, look at how TripAdvisor was in the past. Customers would look at a product on TripAdvisor. They, initially, they would go direct to that, or they make an inquiry direct to that um, operator, that accommodation, then they introduced online booking, which is fine. That still went through. There was a commission taken. But now, what they're doing is, that because TripAdvisor have acquired things like well, Viator and a booking system called Bokun, um, as well as many other things that they're in the pipeline of doing. Um, they are now giving preferential treatment in terms of listings, uh, paid listings, to those who pay for it if they are on a Bokun account. So you have to use the booking platform that they have purchased to gain preferential treatment to allow you to create paid listings on TripAdvisor. Now, Paid listings on TripAdvisor, I am dead set against. Now, if you can think about how what that is going to actually do, if they say that they've got caveats on it in terms of the number of reviews, etc., but even still, you could have you could have four and a half star reviews. You could be up near the top in terms of the listing, but uh, someone with maybe four star reviews could pay for a listing. So they could have slightly lower listings, uh, uh, reviews than you, pay for a listing and be seen above your listing because they paid for it and because they are part of the Bokun ecosystem. That is wrong. And this is why TripAdvisor are no longer, in my opinion, an independent review system. From a customer's point of view, they see, oh, there's a listing, there's a review. They must be great because they're near the top. Let's book through them or whatever that would be. But now that it's paid, it's no longer independent. So it's another thing to think about. Um, for my opinion, TripAdvisor have have have, you, have ripped, basically ripped the, the spine out of what their business and initially was set out to do, and that was to offer the impartial reviews. Now they are just focused on paying back shareholders or focusing on the money side of things. TripAdvisor still plays an important role, yes, but don't rely on it for that type of thing. When it comes to reviews, I would I I used to run workshops in terms of how you can rank better on TripAdvisor. I still do it to a certain extent, but I also have the caveat on it to say, yeah, you can have reviews on TripAdvisor, but I would focus having more reviews on Google. Never bet against Google. Helps with your rankings, help with many other factors as well, which we'll touch on later. Um, so if you can, focus on Google reviews. 
Now, if someone's booked through TripAdvisor uh, or, or whatever other OTA you use, have them leave the review there. But if they've booked direct, start directing them to Google to leave Google reviews, because that will help with your SEO. It will help with many other factors as well. But again, we'll touch on that later. OTAs also compete against you in Google Ads. So if you're running your own marketing campaigns, if you're running your own Google Ads, OTAs compete against you. And they also compete against you and use your brand name in their Google Ads. So again, which I'm dead set against. There should be a caveat that if they do use your brand name uh, in your Google Ads and you're, you're running Google Ads at the same time, you should say, you should have the, the, you should give them approval of yes or no, run Google Ads, but don't use my brand name or whatever that would be. But they don't do that, they just do it automatically. The other thing I don't like is a lot of these online travel agents have other partners. So um, we're going to show later uh, briefly a, a quote from Peter Syme, who runs Splash Whitewater Rafting in Fife um, about Google Ads. But what he found is by listing on things like TripAdvisor, they have partnerships with Grouping.com, for example. And he suddenly noticed his products being on Grouping.com, which he did not want because the type of custom you get through Grouping uh, is different from going direct or through TripAdvisor because Grouping.com bookings, all they look for is promotions, discounts. You're not really going to get long-lasting relationships with those, those type of customers. It's a different type of customer that you get. So it's that's another thing that OTAs do as well. They can put your products on anything. And I also saw uh, one other OTA started creating many landing pages to try and compete with uh, SEO. So their own listing with their own OTA was appearing in the, uh, in the first page of Google. And then there was two other websites there that seemed to be operators or seemed to be accommodation providers. But when you actually clicked in and went through the products, they were actually the same products and driven by the same OTA. The whole website was created by the OTA, again, to try and flood the first page of Google, to try and ease out anyone who's other OTAs, but also those who are going to try and go for direct bookings. So there's so many other things that you probably don't realize what online travel agents are doing. And they're all trying to compete with each other. And they're all doing things which in my mind, and in my opinion, are not quite right. So in terms of Google Ads, they do compete against you. So, although this is based in Barcelona, uh, a very big, uh, well-known company called Fat Tire Tours. Uh, they have a Google ad there. Um, Barcelona, uh, Barcelona Bike Tours um, by Fat, Fat Tire Tours. Directly underneath them was Barcelona Bike Tour from TripAdvisor. Now, that listing from TripAdvisor was the exact same product as the Barcelona Bike Tours. It led, it was basically driven by the same, uh, the same company, so it was Fat Tire Tours product on the TripAdvisor website. The good thing is, the Fat Tire Tours ad is first, but ultimately, TripAdvisor is directly above, uh, below them, advertising the same product. So not only are Fat Tire Tours spending money on Google Ads to try and attract direct traffic, they're also having to compete with TripAdvisor, who is trying to target the same product, try to, selling, to sell their product um, to the same customer. Um, so ultimately, the customer has a decision. Do they go direct, which they could do? And if they do, great. But then they can click on the same product go through TripAdvisor, and then they have to pay TripAdvisor the 20 to 30% commission that they have to pay them for that. So it's, it just adds so many different facets to the ultimate bottom line of tourism business because of your own marketing, because we have to pay OTAs and everything else as well. And again, we'll come on to that. This is Peter Stein, uh, who runs Splash Whitewater Rafting in Fife. He's very well known in the industry. He, he, uh, there's nothing that Peter has not done marketing-wise uh, in terms of his business, he's, he's very successful at it. And over the last 15 years of using Google Ads, he's now stopped. Um, the, the OTAs are just better at it than me, I have def uh, and they have deeper pockets. They have even used our brand name in their ads. I made the decision to let them win the PPC battle, and I have focused my marketing on social channels and niche SEO, where I can still win for now. Social is under price market just now. It is where Google PPC was around 2003 to 2006. Operators and tourism businesses can do well with social and have direct relationships with their guests, which is the only strategic advantage in the digital era. So that is from someone here in Scotland who knows his stuff, who has 
ran his business for many years and other businesses. You know, he advises so many other tourism businesses as well. He has stopped uh, Google PPC. He's focusing on things like Facebook advertising, which he's had great success with, especially during COVID. Um, in fact, during his time with his uh, kayaking and rafting, etc., he's actually had to turn business away because the demand has been there, again, from locals and the domestic. But he's seeing more success on social and through Facebook ads and through social media posts and that type of thing. And again, and he, the last part of it there, he hits the nail on the head, is having that direct relationship with his guests is the only advantage that he has had. And it's made sure that he's survived. It's made sure that he's managed to get through this period as much as he can. And, and he's still um, got tours and, and activities and various other things he's working on just now. He has accommodation as well. So that's coming from Peter. And I'm a big fan of Peter. I, I love what he does. And he is very, very knowledgeable. So, but the caveat to this, there's always a caveat. Um, what he has said recently is, because of the way the world is at the moment, um, there is some short wins to have on Google Ads at this time because a lot of the online travel agents are not spending the same amount of money as they were due pre-COVID. So at the moment, the cost per click for a lot of different things has gone down. So it is relatively cheap just now for Google Ads, but that will go back up again. So if you can do some Google Ads, do it now, and then just monitor that. If you start seeing the cost per click going back up, especially when OTAs and other businesses start doing more and more of this thing, that's when to maybe switch that channel off, um, unless you're getting lots of business from it, of course. But focus more on the Facebook ads, et cetera, from there. And, and one of the later workshops, I think it's the last workshop we've got, is going to be purely on Facebook ads and how you can market and effectively use Facebook ads to drive those leads and bookings. And I think it's going to be a very important one, so hopefully you can enjoy me on that one. So that's for Peter um, in terms of focusing more on the direct channels and building up those relationships with your guests. So here is my, <coughs> excuse me, my opinion. If you're more than 50%, uh, if more than 50% of your revenue is generated by an OTA, you do not own your business. You are, and, and some of you may not like this, but you are in the same bracket as an Uber driver. Basically, you've got Uber, who is an overriding brand. You've got many drivers who use the Uber brand to go out and generate their own business. They pay a commission to Uber, but then they keep whatever they keep to make a living. And that is no different from a TripAdvisor. It's no different from a Booking.com. If you are heavily reliant on those OTAs, you are an Uber driver. You do not own your own business. Your brand is not being seen. Your brand is not gaining that trust. They are, as I said at the very start of this. So if you are happy being that Uber driver, that's completely fine. Um, if you're happy taking those bookings and taking the, the revenue from it, fill your boots, go for it, and, uh, and all power to you. But if you're in the, the thinking of it, you want to grow, grow your business, have a legacy, have something that you can sell at a later date, uh, something that's going to be worth value, something that's going to be passed on to a family member or, or whatever you want to do at a later date, you have to grow your business. Uh, you basically, you will not be able to sell a business or worth any value if you're heavily relying on an OTA because the bookings come from them. You don't own that customer data. Like I say, you don't own the revenue streams that, where that comes from. So you won't be able to sell your business uh, as much as you think. Even though you may have good revenue coming in, it won't be from direct channels. And that is the only way to secure a decent sale of your business. It's the only way to secure a business if that is something you're looking to do further down the line. So if you're that heavily reliant, you are pretty much under the mercy of that OTA. So have a think about where you are just now. Do, is this what you want for yourself? Is this what you want for your business? If so, great. If not, this is where you maybe need to start changing things. And I'm not saying switch the OTAs off now <laughs> uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but just start thinking about what you can do going forward in terms of becoming that media company and driving those direct bookings. Unfortunately, at the moment, because of what the world is going through, OTAs are frantically trying to refocus on the local and domestic market. Up until now, OTAs have been predominantly focused on international travelers with the exception of maybe Airbnb. Airbnb is the only sort of online travel agent um, that does have a strong focus on local and domestic because of the way they, they have been set out. Um, and that's why they are actually doing pretty well at the moment in terms of other OTAs because they do have that strong focus on, on local and domestic markets. You know, when we are looking for stuff for my family, 
We do look at other websites, but we also, one of the first places we go to is unfortunately Airbnb. Um, and it's just because of the ease of use, it's because of trying to get those direct, uh, bookings. But what, because I am knowledgeable in terms of what's happening in the industry, I will see if I can find that person on Airbnb. And then I'll ultimately, I'll see if I can find that guest house, that accommodation through a direct channel. If it's there, I will always book direct. If it's not, I will go through Airbnb. So. So one of the reasons why it's important to have your own website as well, um, which we'll come on to. But other OTAs are frantically trying to refocus on a local and domestic market. If this happens and if they do it well, which we can't, we, we, that will be a disaster for a lot of local domestic tourism business, in my opinion, because ultimately one of the best and easiest ways to market your business, especially through things like Facebook and through Google ads and everything else, is through local search and through local ads you should be dominant in that without having to go through an online travel agent, uh, or, you, or you can be dominant in that without having to go through an online travel agent. If the OTAs start to go down this route and go down this route heavily, which they may well do now because of COVID, it's just going to be another challenge that everyone will have and we cannot let this happen. So again, make sure you build up your strong direct channels. So this is what I, I just wanted to, uh, I sketched out a little sum in terms of what you possibly could be paying in terms of an OT in terms of commission and what this means for your marketing budgets, what this means for everything else going forward. So I just sketched this out and I based it on the 192,000 per year annual. You may be less, you may be more, but I based it on what was the, the average for a small business. So an OT takes at least 20%. I've seen this as high as 40%, but let's, for the sake of this uh, argument, let's go by 20% and say your annual turnover is around about the 192,000. So let's look at three avenues. If you are 40% reliant on OTA sales in terms of your revenue, 70% reliant uh, on OTA revenue sales or 100% reliant, which many people are. So what does that mean in terms of what you pay back? So that means that for 40%, you're about 77,000 of your revenue is generated by OTAs. If you're 70% reliant, about um, 134,500 is generated by OTAs. And obviously, if you're 100%, that's a full 192. So there's, that's quite a lot of money considering the average but a turnover that a business makes of 192,000. It doesn't matter if you're 40%, doesn't matter if you're 70%. It doesn't matter if you're 100%, that is a large chunk of money that's being generated by those OTAs. So if you minus 20%, that means every year you're spending just over 15,000 if you're 40%, which isn't too bad, I suppose, no, uh, considering. But when you start reaching the 70% or close to that and upwards, well, you're paying close to 27,000 a year to OTAs. And obviously, if you're 100% reliant, you're paying close to 39,000 pounds a year. So that, that's huge amounts of money to be giving away to someone else, but in my opinion, you could be doing spending less and getting more direct bookings. And don't get me wrong, that will take time. No, that, that's not going to happen overnight. Um, you will get initial bookings when you're trying to generate direct bookings. And again, it's always finding that balance. But once you start generating more and more direct bookings, you can then rely less on the OTAs and then start to see that switch happening in terms of one or the other. So, but ultimately it's still a lot of money. And I know this was a, uh, in fact, then you've got other overheads, you've got your other marketing, you've got et cetera, et cetera, on top of the money you're spending towards OTAs. So it could be a lot of money that you're ultimately spending. And looking at turnover is important, but the most important aspect of the revenue generated is your profit. So how much profit are you actually making, making per product? How much profit are you making in the actual business? That is what really matters because that's what's going to drive your business forward. That's when it's going to make sure that you have a business that will survive and grow in the years to come. So your profit is the most important part. So what profit are you making? There's no point uh, in running a business where you're breaking even every year. Um, no, it's fine obviously to do that and it's fine to break even and you're still giving yourself a wage and still making a living but ultimately you really want to create a profit because that way you grow, you can hire more 
hire more resources, do whatever you need to do to grow your business going forward. So ultimately, you need to look at your profit margins and what you're doing. And the closer, the closer you are to your revenue streams in terms of direct, is the closest you can be. Uh, the better and the stronger your business will become. If you are further away from that, if you're going through many LTAs and you no know, heavily reliant on them, not like I say, not focused on. Uh, um, uh, not, not uh, the commission rates, no, you're having to pay them and you're, you are uh, stepping away further and further from the cash flow and you're not in charge of your cash flow because the OTAs are, for example, because the cancellation policies they're in charge of, they're in charge of all the other things as well. They hold back money before they can give it to you, et cetera, et cetera. So the closer you are to those revenue streams, the better. And you can only do that by going direct. So think about what you're doing. Think about what you're spending. Have a, have a closer look at what you're spending each year in terms of OTAs, in terms of other marketing efforts, in terms of uh, your overheads, especially now with everything going on. Um, you, may, you may surprise yourself how much you're actually spending. Now, this was a graphic I, I created a little while back for a, for a blog post, but it's still relevant today. Now, if you're doing Google Ads, your own Google Ads, which you could be competing against in terms of OTAs, plus any other marketing efforts, plus the OTA commission, plus your operating costs, in my opinion, that equals unsustainability. No, that can't keep happening. No, and, and commissions from OTAs are only going to increase. They're only going to add in other fees. So it's going to get harder and harder for you to create profit in your business. And add to that, we've now got COVID. So you've got the COVID effect on top of all of that, less bookings, less footfall, less international customers, Yes, we could try to focus more on international, uh, sorry, uh, local and domestic, but ultimately we're going to generate less revenue uh, for, for the short term until things start to improve. So all of these combined is going to create less revenue for your business and less profit. So it's, it's again, it's just making sure that you are covering everything. But just to highlight, you know, if you're 70% reliant or close to that, it's reliant on an OTA and you're at the base rate of 20% at the average uh, annual spend, you're approximately spending or giving an OTA £2,233 per month. Now, yes, I run a marketing agency, but I can guarantee you that for that type of budget, if you were to put that into a marketing spend, you could easily drive direct bookings to your business for even a fraction of that cost, um, using things like Facebook advertising or whatever. But that is basically what you're spending. OTAs are nothing more than a, a marketing channel. And if you think that marketing channel is doing well for you, great. But ultimately, if you are 70% reliant or thereabouts, and you're at 20% commission, and you are making roughly 192000 a year, maybe more, maybe less. But if you are at that, you're spending over £2,000 a month to them, which could be spent on direct channels. Now, if you can spend half of that on marketing direct and then another half on OTAs, that's even better. That will allow you to then grow your business direct. But that is ultimately what you're paying every month um, or potentially paying every month to an OTA. It's a large amount, a large amount of money. Um, and there, in my opinion, there's other ways you can do that to market your business. Uh, so let me double check time to see where we are. Okay, we're doing okay. So, but as I said, one thing you don't want to do quite yet is don't delete your listing. No, don't, don't run off now delete your listings and, and do things, uh, just suddenly switch those channels off. That, that's not what I'm saying. The OTAs, as I mentioned at the very start, do have an important role to play. My issue is when businesses are so heavily reliant on them um, because that's what causes issues. That's what causes issues in terms of making sure that your business survives through a crisis like this. And you need to make sure you're going to survive the next crisis because there will always be another crisis. Now, whether that's another pandemic, whether that's coronavirus coming back, a volcano erupting, like as I say, or a terrorist attack, or what, whatever that would be, there will always be another crisis around the corner. And it's just making sure that you protect your business for whenever that happens. But don't delete your listing just yet, because there are benefits to using an OTA, for sure. It obviously gets you a greater reach, especially initially if you're focusing, if you're just starting out in business, or uh, if you don't have strong direct channels at the moment, you will get greater reach on an OTA. Now, through an OTA, um, what, the way I like to suggest that you use OTAs is to use it in a, to a certain extent where you're just trying to fill up extra 
you know, spare rooms or extra seats that, that you have on your products. Uh, not to try and book up everything for your full capacity, but for those bits of capacity that are maybe you haven't just filled up quite yet, that is when an OTA can be, can be beneficial. They're also beneficial for trying new products. So if you want to uh, create a new product and test the market, putting that onto an OTA first to see what type of uptake you get, to see if it's successful. And if it is successful, then you can start putting that onto your direct channels uh, and promoting it that way as well. So it's a great way of testing out new products because, it, again, it does give you a greater reach because of the amount of people who use these type of uh, platforms as well. So the reach is important. Obviously, as I mentioned before, the trust goes into the OTA. So cons consumers do trust OTAs more than your own business, um, especially if you don't have direct channels or strong direct channels. So consumers will go to them. They will go to your trip advisors. They will go to your booking.coms. They will go to your Airbnbs because they trust them because, because of the, their ease of use, because they can search for different types of products and things to do in a particular area. And this is why some of the content that we advise or a lot of our customers is, create content not just about your business, but about things that are in and around your destination, about other businesses and things to do in your area. They'll create articles on that and have them on your website. So if someone wants to do a search on that, they might not go to a TripAdvisor. They might land on your page. It's more an, inf an informational page uh, that then has maybe call to actions about how they can experience these different experiences. Now, one of the things that you should be doing now uh, in COVID, though we're all hurting, we're all seeing businesses going to the wayside because of, of COVID. You should, even if it's a competitor, even if it's a, a business who you don't normally de deal with, you should be creating partnerships now with those businesses in your areas. So whether it's, if you're a tour company, creating a, a partnership with an accommodation provider. Uh, if you're an accommodation provider, you know, partner up with other businesses in your area that can bring they can establish customers and you can pass customers one to the other to try and create that holistic experience of accommodation, of experiences, of attractions, all these different things. Try to create packages that benefit everyone. Um, though I know a lot of businesses who have now partnered up with their competitors, though especially like things like coach companies or, or camper van companies or companies who deal with whitewater rafting, like Peter Sign, for example, they have connected with but they, you would maybe class as a rival company to pass on customers if capacity gets too much in that way. They're helping the economy and they're helping bring business back and they're helping each other's businesses survive and not to lose that customer because they've seen that they've tried to help them by finding someone else to take out that experience or stay at another hotel or, or accommodation, whatever that would be. Create those partnerships and that's going to be so strong going forward. Um, and I know from the, from the guys here at Visit Murray, that's, that's a strong part of what they're trying to do as well as part of this community is to try and get those partnerships going and get everything going. That is what's going to drive direct bookings. That is what's going to drive the economy going forward for, for many of you guys. So create those partnerships as well. And that will help build that trust and get that content out there and build that trust within consumers to come to you more direct. So it's, again, it's, they all have their part to play. And just thinking about what you can do within that. OTAs obviously help you get bookings. At the end of the day, you want to get bookings, you want to get revenue in, and I completely understand that. And OTAs are a great way of doing that. Um, it's just not, I say, as I say, relying so heavily on them that it's, it's all of your bookings, it's all of your revenue, or a great proportion of it, as I just mentioned, for, 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 the, for the various reasons I've already mentioned. So just have a think about why you're using OTAs. Yes, are great getting bookings. Yes, are great... Uh, Customers trust them, but ultimately you really want them to come direct to you because you want to gain that trust. You want to get the booking direct. So you're not paying 20% commission, 30% commission, 40% commission. This is ultimately the goal that you want to try and get to. And obviously the, the, one of the biggest attractions is you don't need to pay anything to an OTA until someone books up a tour with you or books up an accommodation with you, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the other added benefit. Don't get me wrong with with. Direct marketing, yes, you do have an upfront marketing spend, for, but not always. No, there is, I'm going to explain some ways you can do this for free without spending any money. It's just going to be time, which ultimately more people, more businesses have time at the moment because of everything that's going on. So, um, but ultimately, <coughs> OTAs allow you to pay as you go, basically, um, which is obviously a, a great benefit. But it, like, as I say, we've went, been through all the downsides as well, but these are the upsides of using an online travel agent. So that's what I would say. So 
to answer the original question, should you focus on OTA or should you focus on direct? Well, if you can, I would say you want to have about 20% of your revenue or thereabouts generated by OTAs, around 80% generated direct. This is the ultimate goal that you should try to achieve. This is the ultimate goal that we want to see all tourism businesses getting to. So 80% of your revenue, 80% of your profit is driven direct. You have those connections with your customers. Having that connection with your customer um, allows you to then upsell, allows you to then bring them back for a future booking, a future experience, um, allows you to market to them again more effectively going forward. Um, but you can still fill up those empty seats uh, and your tours and your those empty beds that you maybe have in your accommodation, empty rooms, etc. by the other 20%. That is, this is the ultimate goal that I think you should be trying to achieve. And it will take time. If you are heavily reliant on OTAs, it will take time. Uh, though Peter Syme, uh, going back to him, though his OTAs are minuscule compared to his direct bookings. Um, and it can be done. It just takes time. It just takes effort. But ultimately, if you do put in that effort, you will get to these sort of figures. And it will happen. Um, so it's just look at what you're doing just now in terms of your revenue streams, look at what you're doing just now and just ascertain, okay, is this what you really want for your business or do you want to try and change things going forward? And it won't happen overnight, as I say, it will take time, it will take effort. So attracting direct traffic, we're going to look at two aspects. Three methods, the only cost is your time. Um, and we are going to look at a couple of different paid methods, but these are on a budget and it's things that you could be doing right now if you really wanted to. So. Free methods, obviously, creating blogs, articles, travel guides, things that you can write that can bring people to your website. Um, so if they do a search, things to do in Inverness, things to do in Aberdeen, whatever that would be, they'll create articles based around that. So you know, when you actually, there's, there's various tools that you can use um, in terms of uh, searching what people are, are, are looking for. Now, Google, if you just start typing things uh, if, in your search bar, if you put, uh, start typing things to do in, um, it will actually, that's a little list of uh, suggestions that comes up. That is a key indicator of knowing what are popular searches for Google in your area, because Google tends to work from local search. So by typing things, in, things to do in, you can basically see what comes up in your list. And that will give you an idea of what people are searching for. There's other tools, um, BuzzSumo is another one, and there's various other tools out there. And I'll make sure I'll get that over to the guys so they can, they can distribute these different tools to you um, that allow you to see what people are searching for, the, 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 the high-ranking keywords, um, the questions that people are asking for, you know, that type of thing. That is what you can be writing blog articles around, travel guides around. And do not make these in any way trying to sell your products. They should be more inspirational, inspiring pieces um, and I understand that a lot of people may be not too comfortable with writing that's completely fine um, though I was at that stage when I've had to learn to write and I've got better over the years because I've had to do it personally myself that's why I have my own team of copywriters to, to make me sound good but uh, ultimately you can basically write some blog articles get your own the best way to write them is to write them as you speak so that comes across as more genuine it comes across as more personable. Um, but ultimately, you can then give whatever you write, go on to People Per Hour, go on to Fiverr.com, spend £10, £20, and get someone to refine it, make you sound better, and then get that online. Do that once a month at least, and you'll be fine. Get that up there, get it run. But ultimately, you can write these yourself and get them on there. Um, though in this day and age, when it comes to content, well-written content is obviously important. But people these days, because of social media, because of the quick way of reading information and everything else, they forgive the odd grammar mistake, they forgive the odd spelling mistake, that type of thing. So don't overly criticize what you're, what you're using. Obviously, you want to get it right if you can. But if you really want to write something yourself, get, then get someone else to have a little proofread of it before you put it online. But ultimately, these are things you could be doing for free. Blog articles, travel guides, things about your area really inspiring pieces that can get people to you are, are things that offer you now one of the analogies i've used them many times before is if you were running an attraction that was a distillery um, and you had someone in your business who was a, a an absolute master at whiskey tasting 
you could be creating articles and blog pieces about whiskey every every month or every fortnight or whatever you wanted to do about different whiskies, the tasting and what food each whiskey pairs with and why this whiskey is different from another whiskey. And you could be, you could, could be creating lots of stuff and lots of information that you could be putting out on blogs that will hopefully help you through time rank better on SEO, rank better and drive people to your website. Because the more people you can get to your website, the more direct traffic you can get to your website, the better chance you have of getting direct bookings. Similar to blogs, but also creating videos. No, everyone has a smartphone now uh, on, on these recording 4K video. Um, there is no excuse not to use video. Um, the next um, workshop will be covering uh, video uh, uh, a lot in terms of how you can be using these different tools, showing examples, etc., uh, the different types of content you could be producing. But ultimately, you could be creating videos now. Um, you could be going out through uh, your destination if it's safe to do so creating videos, you know, talking about your area, things to do in your area, um, even if it's just you talking about a particular topic, like I say, whiskey tasting or whatever that would be. These are things you could be doing for, for now for free using free editing tools. YouTube has free editing tools. You can use cheap tools like iMovie on an iMac. There's the PC equivalents as well to create little quick videos, get them up online, get them up on YouTube, add them to your website, get them onto social media and just start producing these, get them out as and when you can. And this will just let people know that you're here, you're still, you're surviving, uh, you're, you're providing inspiration, and that's also going to attract direct bookings and uh, direct travel traffic as well. Social posting again, whether you're creating blogs, videos, just general social posts, don't stop that, get that out there. Social posting, when it comes to that, you want to have, again, using the 80-20 analogy, 80% inspirational and inspiring, 20% sales and product. So not always selling, but having more inspirational pieces, asking questions, running competitions, running polls, getting information from your customers in terms of what people like to like to do. Um, no, we were, we did a, a, a social post for a company in Scotland. Um, and one of the questions we just asked for, we, we showed a, a picture of a fish and chips uh, uh, it was for a, a camper van company. So we showed a picture of a fish and chips um, and we basically sort of says, where would you uh, rate the best fish and chips you've had during your journey and your time in Scotland. Um, and leave a comment below. That got good engagement. People are saying, oh, I prefer this chip shop. I prefer this restaurant. I prefer this. I prefer that. Um, this is the best place to go. And little things like that, just drive engagement, drive social interaction, uh, engage your customers. Um, and then the other 20% could be a little bit more promotional where you're, you're not overly selling your product, but at least mentioning your product and leading people off to take out a tour to you know, book your accommodation, again, whatever your, your market is. Email campaigns, another free way you, you can do this. I'm going to touch on this a little bit shortly. Um, email campaigns is almost a forgotten art. It's uh, almost uh, something that people don't really do anymore because of social media and because of other things. Email campaigns and gathering email addresses is hugely important. And we'll come on to that in a second. But running email campaigns is a free thing that you could be doing right now. Whether it's targeting new customers, whether it's targeting customers from the past, et cetera, et cetera. Running email campaigns is hugely important. Um, one little caveat I will say when running email campaigns, and this is from our own uh, stats in terms of all of our customers and from what others in the industry are say, saying, so it's not just from us, is if you run email campaigns, try to, you can do some testing in this, try both methods to see, because it does depend on each customer, but generally, in general terms, running highly graphical emails in terms of promotional offers and you know, big images and lots of images and lots of text and everything else don't tend to work. Um, you tend to get less click-through rates and you tend to get less engagement than sending a plain text email campaign. So say something that looks like it's came from your own inbox. It says, hi, whatever that person's name is. It's plain text. Um, it maybe breaks down the top five things to do and Mori, for example, whatever, whatever you want to write about. Plain text email, you maybe have one image in there at the very most. Then at the end of it, it's got an email signature as if it came from the business owner, from you personally, from a, from a guide or some other staff member, but it looks like a personal email has came from their own Google account or their own email account. Those type of emails actually tend to get better engagement and better click-through rates and keep people subscribed longer than ones that are highly graphical. So, but again, try both. 
see what you see what uptake you get but what you tend to find is plain text emails will get a better uh, engagement uh, which is ultimately what you want facebook live and webinars so facebook live and doing webinars talking about your destination talking about um, things that are happening in your business or or, or surrounding areas um, why your products are better whatever you want to create a webinar around again don't make it a sales pitch um, you can do that free you can do it now you could be running Facebook live you could be running LinkedIn live you could be running uh, things on Instagram uh, live you can be doing that now to drive engagement you know, create a little webinar um, have people sign up to get that webinar that webinar could be free or a Facebook live could be free say hey um, join us here we're going to talk about a particular aspect of the destination. It could be a little virtual tour or, or, or whatever that would be, or showing off your accommodation, your, your, your hotel or, or guest house, things that people can find out, asking, you know, answering people's questions uh, and fears and concerns about COVID. You know, get that, have a webinar based on that maybe as well. These are all things you can be doing for free. You can do it from your phone, you can do it from your computer, and you can interact with your customers and see questions coming in as well. So again, look at well, whether it's using zoom like we're using just now think about what you can do in running these sort of live events again all those things you could literally be doing for free uh, you can be marketing your business directing uh, attracting that direct traffic to come to you and hopefully through that you'll get leads and bookings from it but this is the first steps of generating those direct traffic and getting more eyes on your brand getting more eyes to know who you are what you're all about and why you are the best of what you do now the paid advertising methods in terms of on a budget is things like Facebook ads and at the moment Google ads. Now you could run effective campaigns on Facebook for three pounds a day. It's not a lot of money. So if you do have a little bit of money to spend in terms of budget, three pounds a day on a Google ad uh, or a Facebook ad rather can get you a long way. Um, even if you're running a series of ads, which I'll show you shortly in a second, um, a, a real life example. Uh, Google ads as well, again, are, are cheap at the moment, um, depending on the keyword that you use. But you could literally run Google Ads for as little as five pounds a day as well. Yeah, but then when you start to see that price creeping up and maybe you're not getting quite the same return, then yes, you would stop. Um, as long as you're making more money than you're spending more money, that's fine. But as soon as that starts flipping the other way, that's when you, you want to refine those ads or stop them or do something about a little bit different. But um, again, one of the last workshops we're doing uh, in a couple of weeks' time is all about Facebook. But I just wanted to show you quickly about using Facebook for a low budget and what that can achieve. So this was, this is all about email marketing and, and, and using Facebook to, to drive this. Um, so we're going to cover a little bit about email marketing first, then I'll show you the live example of Facebook and why all this sort of ties in together uh, in terms of both um, and also why this helps drive direct booking. So when it comes to email, please start collecting them now. You want to have an email newsletter, you want to run maybe a Facebook ad to drive email and uh, have people sign up for something. Um, again, we'll come on to that in that last workshop. But ultimately, you really want to collect his first name, last name, and email address. Now, a lot of people don't do this anymore because they think, I don't want to send out email newsletters. It's not something I want to do. And if that's not something you want to do or a channel you want to do, that's fine, but you should still be collecting this information because it's not just about sending out email newsletters for customers. It's about many other aspects as well. So you have emails, uh, which is what you ultimately want to try and collect for the information, which you can obviously send out and create newsletter campaigns. That's what people generally think what emails uh, and collecting that information is for. But you may or may not know, um, is you can also use it. Oh, uh, that just went down. Let's see if I can, here we go. Yeah, you can also use it to upload information into Facebook. So you could basically create you can gather up all the first names, last names, email addresses, and upload that information into Facebook. You can then target those people on Facebook ads uh, because you have found their, you have their email, uh, last name and first name. Once that's uploaded to Facebook, if Facebook can find an account based on those criteria, you're able to target to them. But not only that, there's, there's other aspects of that as well. So yeah, so you can run targeted ads directly on Facebook from the emails that you collect or from your past customers. So you can have uh, your past customers uploaded into Facebook as well to target them specifically. But you can also create what's called a lookalike audience. So you can upload information, say for example, from your past customers, 
Uh, you can upload that information into Facebook. You can even say beside that in one of the fields uh, in, the, in the Excel file that you would upload, the value of what that each customer spent. So Facebook will then use that information to then find other customers who are more likely to spend that similar amount of money and have the similar interests as the people who were your past customers to build up a new audience of potential customers to attract them towards your brand. So this is why collecting email addresses is so hugely important. And it's again, one of the pitfalls of sometimes using an OTA is that they don't always give this information. So by collecting all these information and collecting email addresses and first names and last names, you could be doing all this on Facebook as well. But it allows you to target, as I say, your past customers. So if you wanted to run specific ads to entice them back for referrals or uh, to say, you know, even to run ads to say, hey, could you leave a review on Google or whatever? I hope we're glad, you're glad your time with us. Here's, uh, here's a, a, an added piece of value to entice you back or a discount to entice you back, that type of thing. That ad can be running specifically for your customers and your customers only. So again, this is why collecting email data uh, and names and addresses, et cetera, is hugely important. Even, with the, even the country where they've came from, the more data that you can collect, the better. But ultimately, the easiest form is first name, last name, and email address. But you can also upload that information into Google Ads as well to target them with Google Ads or Google Display Ads, that type of thing. So collecting email addresses is hugely important. And it's one of these things that a lot of businesses just forget about. And when we come onto the website side of things a little later, we'll, 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 we'll highlight this a little bit further. But ultimately, this is why collecting email addresses is hugely important. Um, one of the caveats is never, ever, please ever buy a mailing list. They are a waste of money. They are not, uh, you're basically buying a list of people that are probably out of date, to be honest. Um, anyone who's, I've seen buying lists that, that the email lists are completely out of date. Um, they're not warmed up to your, uh, to your brand. They've not asked to be uh, sent any information from your brand. And ultimately, you are going to cause a full GDPR time bomb in your business. If you get told up for that, you're marketing to people who are not initially signed up for your business because you bought that list, you could be heavily, heavily fined. And you could possibly find that that could be make or break for your business. So never, ever, ever, ever buy a list. Earn the right to have that customer's data through bookings, through email campaigns, through other marketing campaigns. Earn the right for that information. Never buy a list. So again, quickly on Facebook ads. Um, I wanted to show you a live example. So this was for a company based in uh, the Cotswolds in the Lake District. They run tours in the Cotswolds in the Lake District. So they run chauffeur-driven tours. So they'll take them out for uh, people, pick them up from London or other places. So it's a slightly high value. It's about more of a high value ticket. You know, it's the, I think the, one of the base products for a, for a full car, for a family or a group of people is something like four, nine, five pounds. But, uh, so it's not, not a cheap tour. But ultimately, this is just to sort of show you one aspect of what you can do on uh, on Facebook. So we ran a series of ads. Initially, we ran one ad at ten pounds a day, and then we ran we broke that up into three separate ads: one at five pounds per day, one at two pounds per day, one at three pounds per day. The one at three pounds per day was actually the most successful one. This was going to a Facebook form for people to fill out the information very quickly and inquire about a tailor-made tour, whether it was a day tour, a multi-day tour, uh, or experience of the Cotswolds. Um, so with that, over the last, just under two months, um, that generated to 261 leads. So they got 261 inquiries from running ads at a total of around 10 pounds a day. So it's still not hugely expensive, but still at 10 pounds a day, one of the ads being three pounds a day, which was the, the most effective one, getting 118 leads from it. The one at five pounds a day, they get 81. And the one at two pounds a day, they actually got 16. So they the Facebook form was the most effective. And what we're finding just now is a lot more people are inquiring about products or inquiring about uh, things because of COVID rather than booking online because they've probably got so many questions. They just want to make sure things are okay. Um, and maybe a little bit nervous about booking online because of the main fear of COVID just now is not about catching the virus. It's about losing that deposit. It's about losing money. So more people are inquiring just to alleviate those fears. So, Facebook form, through that, they had 261 bookings. And remember, their basic chauffeur-driven product was £495. So 261 leads gives them a potential sales value of £129,195. From a Facebook campaign that in its entirety has spent £531.16. 
So that was £531 and 16 pence. They got 261 leads that could potentially, they obviously still have to, it's all lead driven, but they still have to close the sale. But you know, these guys are great at what they do, but gave them the option to close £129,195 worth of sales. Remember going back to when I was saying using OTAs, you spend 2,300 and something odd pounds a month on commission. 531 pounds got them that. This is why finding the balance of direct and using OTAs is hugely important. And Facebook ads, if done correctly, will help drive that. And again, the workshop um, in a couple of weeks time, will hopefully, will hopefully get this across and what you can do. So this is why direct bookings matter. This is why you should focus more on direct and OTA. But there's one important benefit um, if you are using a, a booking system. So if you're not currently using an online booking platform, so this is different from OTAs. If you're not currently using an online booking platform, there's many of them out there. Um, and this is, this is if you're using an external booking platform. So this is, if you're, this is if you're not using your own internal system. So this is if you're using something like Res Day, Checkfront, you know, there's many, a Fair Harbor, there's many, many out there. Whatever system that you use for your business, they may connect directly with Google. Um, and more importantly, reserve with Google. Now, for those who do not know what reserve with Google is, it is a way of when someone does a Google search of, they may be searching for an accommodation, they may be searching for a, a product, a service, a tour, an experience within your area, and they find that on Google search, um, and you maybe your, your Google My Business this listing is at the site, or they search on a map and then your listing appears in Google Maps, they can book directly in Google without even visiting your website. Now, a lot of consumers don't know that this exists yet, but it's just going to become more and more popular. And you can get this by having a connection through a booking system. So the way it works is someone does a search, the book button is straight in Google. They can then go through, create the booking and book, and then because your booking system has been connected directly with Google, uh, reserved with Google, the, the funds go directly and through your booking platform and through to you. So this is what's happening now. This is what people can do now in terms of booking through Google. So people can book through Google without ever visiting your website. They might see something they see, they might see something they love, and then they book it straight away. So this is why Google is important. This is why a booking platform is important because more and more people are going to be booking this way. Although it's not overly known yet, more and more people in the future will book through this way. And it has other benefits as well. So you're booking direct in Google. Like I say, you're not visiting your website. Um, it's, it's keeping everyone in one place. This is where Google reviews is going to be more important because your reviews will be showing on the same search as everyone else's. If you have really good reviews on Google, you will then have more in chance of people booking your product through Google rather than uh, going off to your website or rather than going off to an OTA. Now, one of the downsides of this at the moment is OTAs are also connecting in with Reserve uh, with Google. So if you have a, a connection with a booking platform, but you're also on an OTA, there is a chance that your OTA book button on, on this Google Reserve will actually be one from TripAdvisor or one from Booking.com. But if you're more uh, reliant on getting direct bookings and not so much on OTAs, then it could go direct to you. So there's, there's different things to look at, but this is happening. It's happening now. It's working now. Once consumers know more, it's more about it and once they're more confident using it, this will only grow in time. So building up rev reviews on Google is hugely important. It's also why your Google My Business listing, that when someone does a search on your brand, your listing appears down the side of your opening times, your reviews and everything else, that is going to be even more important. It's why that should be optimized more and more. Um, though you should be uploading regular photographs to that. You can add little blog posts to it, keep that updated on a regular basis. That's going to be, that's hugely important part of SEO anyway. It's same with reviews, huge part of SEO. But all that combined with direct, with booking through Google, with the chance of either the click on your website and uh, a listing on, on, on a Google search, or if they see your listing on the side, they may book direct through Google. So all these things are going to make it stronger for people like yourself to get direct bookings. So it's one of the advantages of using uh, a booking platform is you can then connect through Google Reserve to 
allow people to do this. And it's as, like I say, it is only going to get more and more popular. So I think we've just reached the hour mark, which is good. I'm going to now move on to websites. So we're going to talk about creating a lead generating website that does not cost the earth. Now, for transparency, now back um, about three or four years ago, um, uh, although we're called the Tourism Marketing Agency now, we used to be called Senshi Digital. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of Japanese culture, so we had a big sort of Japanese theme, Senshi meaning guardian or warrior. So we were the, the digital warriors of, of websites and marketing at the time. And we used to develop a lot of websites. Now, we uh, very knowledgeable in developing websites, or even though I sold that side of the business off, I don't do that side of it anymore. And that, hence the reason why we, we changed the name to Tourism Marketing Agency. It makes people know exactly what we do, uh, as they say on the tin. Um, but back then, we developed a lot of big websites for huge companies like Grayline.com and Max Adventure and other businesses worldwide. And we gained a lot of knowledge in what we did with that. Um, but I could see what was coming. I could see what was coming up in terms of the industry and websites. In my opinion, there's no real money to be made in websites anymore. No, we would have easily charged £15,000 upwards for websites. Um, sometimes, no, we did, did do websites from £5,000 upwards. But on the whole, we were... We focus more on the sort of big players at the time and develop some really big websites. Um, but what that allowed us to do, because they had the budgets, allowed us to do a lot of user testing, allowed us to see how different customers purchased and bought through tourism websites, the user journey, the best ways to lay websites out. And we still use a lot of that information today to advise our customers in terms of how they can lay out their websites. Um, and ultimately because that helps drive bookings, it helps through marketing efforts and everything else as well. So that is why we have all that knowledge. It's why we still use that knowledge today to, to drive this. And we still keep a close eye on websites, but you do not need to spend the same amount of money now because I sold the business off, like I say, because I saw booking platforms starting to generate or offer free websites as part of their offerings, as well as some other things as well. We'll touch on that in a second. So, but ultimately the website is important because that is your customer's experience, first experience of your brand is from that first click of using your website. So generally they do a Google search, they'll land on your website, and if they do, they'll have four to seven seconds of saying, this website's great, this website's rubbish, I'm gonna go and find someone else. Can't find information, is it easy to use? Does it have what I want to find? Is it easy to find the information? You literally have seconds for someone to make that decision. So the experience starts from the first click. This is why the website is so important. It is fundamentally one of the best and important platforms you can have from any marketing standpoint when you're trying to drive direct bookings. The website is. In my opinion, the website is essentially the best employee you could ever have. It helps you sell your products 24 seven. They don't take sick leave, they don't need a pay rise, they don't need days off. Treat your website like an employee. Nurture it, maintain it, optimize it, make sure that you're getting the most out of it. Your website is the best employee you could ever have because that is going to drive direct traffic, drive bookings, drive everything towards your business and build up that trust in your customer's eyes. It is your, it's your ultimate salesperson is your website and you just need to make sure that you're, you're, you're taking care of it and you're doing it in the right way. So, so I've came across, and unfortunately, Scotland has is a little bit behind other countries when it comes to websites. I've seen so many websites in Scotland that are terrible. They are uh, they're just little pages of information, just lots of text, lots of call to actions, lots so confusing. Sometimes no booking platforms. In fact, for the most part, no booking platforms. If you do not take care of that aspect, if it comes across, uh, if your website comes across as being cheaply made, if it comes across as not being professional. Ultimately, your customers are going to think you are a cheap company or, uh, or not a professional company. So your website is hugely important. So just make sure you take care of it. But again, like I say, and I'll show later, you don't need to spend anywhere near the money that you think you need to spend. There's many, many good options out there. So the main elements of generating a, a lead generating website. So this is, again, from all the research we've done, from all our time of building websites. Um, there will be little changes here and there. There will be certain caveats, but ultimately this is um, what I'm going to show you is what I feel is the ultimate placement of elements on a website, things that you should have, um, things that can easily drive the user through to the purchase journey, 
uh, to make ultimately make that booking or make that inquiry. And the website I'm going to show you is based on a tour company, but this would be the same for accommodation, this would be the same for anything else. We'll come on to that, I'll show you in a second. So, landing page, this is the main home page. As soon as someone lands on the home page, this is what they want to see. This is a sort of typical screen size on a desktop. And the reason why I'm showing desktop is what you tend to find is yes, people use more mobiles for searching for stuff and looking for things and doing stuff like that. But when it actually comes to booking, they tend to then switch over to desktop and book more on desktop. The odd occasion, yes, depending on the product, they will book on a mobile um, or Airbnb, for example, they'll do it through an app. But ultimately, they'll go to a website and book through that way. That still happens. So the land on the homepage, you basically want to see the main elements. So you want to see bar at the top, very simple navigation. You don't want to make it too cluttered, a nice big book button. A little bit of text, HTML text, not an image of what it is that you do. What is it? You want people to land on the page and ultimately see what is your offering. So for this made up company, and I used actually used in my book, um, fooddrinktour.com, the ultimate Glasgow food and drink tours tells you exactly what it is that they do as soon as you land on that page. Um, behind that, nice image, or even better still, uh, a nice background video, just with no sound, just playing in the background. It can really draw people in, keep them there, hold them there a little bit longer, and help highlight the type of experience that you have. If you need to, you can have a search on there. Most businesses wouldn't need to do that, but if you, if you did, you could have a search on there to allow people to easily find information, find products, find experiences, etc. But one of the most important parts is what I call the trust bar, and that is directly under the main banner, you have another banner highlighting your reviews. So images of five-star TripAdvisor reviews, five-star Facebook, Google reviews, no Yelp, whatever it is that you use for your review systems, have that on that initial page. So as soon as someone lands on the page, they can instantly see you have good reviews. That helps build up trust initially. Because what I tend to find, and I'm sure many of you listening or watching this just now probably do this already, you may have five-star Google reviews or top rated on Airbnb or whatever it would be, but you tend to put that little logo of that or that accreditation in the footer of your website. So someone has to scroll all the way down to see it. And most people won't scroll all the way down, they'll miss it. So having it on that initial page as soon as someone lands is vitally important. That builds up trust. So having something like that there is, is, is a key, key factor. Then underneath that, you start to see some best selling products. So whether it's accommodation, whether it's experiences, whether your attractions, have three of your best selling products or three of your future products directly under that. So people can see is there's something else to see as they have to start scrolling down. Uh, what I would normally say there um, is to have your, uh, the products that actually give you the most revenue. That's ultimately what you want to have there. So not just your best selling products, but the products that are going to generate you the most profit and the most revenue. Because ultimately you want people to buy more of them. So have them, no more than three. You don't want to give two people too many options. If you start giving people too many options, they start getting a little bit confused. They don't know what they want to do. You have to, when it comes to any form of marketing or website, you have to think of the lowest common denominator. So make it no more than three, make it super focused and highlight the products that are going to generate you the most revenue. Then it may be underneath that, you could have a little promotional banner or something that you'd maybe want to highlight. So something like that is fine as well. And then underneath that, you maybe have some other featured products, you no know, things that you maybe want to highlight, some new products or whatever that would be, have something underneath that as well, just as another option. But again, no more than three. Then you maybe have a little trust bar of you know, little USPs, you know, things that you want to highlight, you know, you money back guarantees, especially now, that's a big thing, you, know, you get a money back guarantee, you know, cancellation policies, blah, 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 whatever it is that you offer, have that in there as well. Then you would have latest stories, travel guides, inspirational pieces, again, Every time you update the website and add a new blog or article, this will be updated. Keeps the website fresh, keeps the homepage fresh, which is all good for SEO. But then underneath that, you can see there we have uh, a newsletter sign up. This is how to do a newsletter sign up. Um, something that gives your customers something back in return. So for this instance, as an example, they'll grab your copy of our exclusive cookbook, which includes the top 12 recipes as voted by our customers. So the idea behind this is this company, they've taken 12 of the chefs of, of the, some of the establishment, establishments that they go around. They've got recipes, they've created a little recipe book that someone can leave their, 
name and email address, and then download that information. Then you've got those email addresses to capture those details, to then market to a future date, whether through Facebook or through email campaigns or whatever that would be. You can set up an automated email campaign that the, the initial email they'll get sent out has a cookbook, and then maybe once a week or once a month or every fortnight, whatever you want to do, they'll get another little travel guide of, hey, did you know about this? Did you know about that? We can offer you this, we can offer you that. Our, our destination offers this. Keep them entertained, keep them, keep those touch points going. If you unsubscribe, you unsubscribe, but you'll keep the ones that are there, weeds out the time wasters, and then that will give you more and more people to market to. And then eventually maybe those people will come back and either book or whatever through, through uh, with you. And then you have your footer at the bottom. Your footer should always contain your main links from the same uh, as the uh, links at the top bar. So people can easily click on something rather than having to scroll all the way back up. If you have a sticky menu, even better, you can have both. But always have your main links at the bottom and any accreditations and social media links and that type of thing as well. But in terms of emails, this is what you normally see in a website. Join our newsletter, first name, last name, email, email address. That's not going to entice anyone. No one is going to sign up and leave their email address if you just have a, a sign up form like that. You have to give something back in return. You are buying their permission to send them something, to send them marketing materials. So make it enticing. Don't just make it a general thing like that, because she's usually stuck in a footer somewhere. That's what I normally see. Make it enticing enough, give them something in return, and you'll probably find you'll start to get more and more signups um, if you are going to give them something in return. So yeah, don't do that, just please. <laughs> So that's how to do an email newsletter on your website. Quickly, just overview of the uh, product page and what we found is the best sort of layout for a product page. Again, nice big image at the top. Uh, this could be a video as well. That's bit, don't make it a background video. Uh, make it a video that someone plays. So they have to click play, which could have sound, which could have uh, highlighting maybe a 60 second video of your experience. But if not, a background image is fine. You could have a video further down the page, which is fine as well. But you can see there, as soon as someone lands on the page, the name of the product, they can see there's some, a quick description, and they can immediately see the book now button, they can see the price, they can see the availability calendar. This could be a form as well if you only take inquiries, whatever it is, how you deal with inquiries or deal with bookings, that is always on the side. Uh, so people could scroll down, they could read more. Uh, although I can't show this in this presentation, that book button as they scroll will always be visible at the side until they reach a certain point. So it makes it super easy for people to you know, book and they can automatically see the price. They can see they need to fill in various details. The itinerary, if you offer an itinerary or if, you, if you're an accommodation provider, the amenities and the facilities that you have, all these different things. A good website to follow, to be honest, is Airbnb. In my, in my opinion, in terms of its layout, my opinion, it's one of the reasons why Airbnb are so successful um, is because the, they have an amazing team uh, when it comes to design, when it comes to the, the experience of using their app, using their website, of searching for and booking products. They are, in my opinion, the gold standard when it comes to things like that. Um, and looking at what they're doing is probably a good indication of what the industry is doing as well. So again, look at what they're doing and keep things very clean, keep it nice and simple booking platform down the side to make it easy for people to go through. So these are the sort of things you would have, itineraries, you know, whatever it is that you want to promote in terms of your facilities, et cetera. You maybe have some reviews or testimonials at the bottom of that. And then related products. So somebody might land on this page, they might think, okay, this, I like the look of this, but then they'll see something else and say, I actually prefer the look of that instead. Even if it's not related products, this could be upsell opportunities as well, whatever that would be. So things, this is the, the way that I would lay out a product page in terms of your website. So high, it's, 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 when it comes to websites, there's a sort of rule that I have. You want to have, you want to keep everything within a three click rule. You want your customers to get to your booking button, your inquiry button and no more than three clicks. Most of the time it can be done in two clicks, but you want it to be in no more than three clicks. Basically someone lands on the homepage, you want them to click on a product or uh, click a search. If they land on that product, that's one click. Then they read that product, they then they click either book or inquiry, that's two. So ultimately, two clicks is what can normally be done in, but three at the very most, because they might go off and search for something and find something else, and then maybe click on another product and then maybe book. So 
but you don't you don't want your pages pages to be any more than three levels deep either, um, because Google anything past that Google will deem as less relevant. So you want to try and keep your pages to as high as the top level as possible, um, but not more than three levels deep, because um, then, like I, like I say, Google sees them as more relevant if they're higher up the, the, the hierarchy of their website as well. So this is ultimately, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what we have found to be the ultimate layout for uh, a travel website, whether it's tours, whether it's activities, how the product page should maybe be laid out. Yes, you may have more information in there. You may have more tabs, but generally in general terms this is sort of layout you should have but i know what you're probably thinking oh yeah but your website like that costs a hell of a lot not necessarily uh, and i'm going to come on to that now so one possible option you can use is some booking platforms like fair harbor or some of the other um, booking platforms do offer free websites and um, so the pros of that is that you get a free website i do put free in, in brackets um website for you Ultimately, you're paying for, for it through the commission that you pay. But a lot of them build websites for free and allow you to do uh, have a good website uh, and do that side of things. Again, one of the reasons why I sold my website is I could see more and more, operate, more, and more booking res and reservation systems doing this. But there are cons to that. You do not own the website. They do. So uh, it means it will be harder for you to add in any other content or functionality uh, a lot of the time. Um, it ties you into that booking platform. So if you had your own independent website um, and you decided to move from one reservation system to another, you could have, have, you have a better chance of doing so and doing so easier. Um, whereas if you were using a booking platform's website, you would probably need to start from scratch all over again with another system, booking platform, whatever that would be. So there is cons to these free websites from reservation systems. But if you're not bothered about that, you're happy using one of their systems, great, go for it. But there is cons to it, you just need to bear that in mind. But what I'm going to show you is a, a theme. Uh, and this one's based, I'm going to show you one for hotels as well, but this one's based for tours and activities. So this is a theme that we have used a lot. It's actually the a, a, a same theme I'm using for a, a commission free OTA that I'm launching called Curiosity uh, in October. Uh, but this theme is incredible. It's a WordPress theme. Uh, it allows you very much a lot of the same elements. You've got the trust bar there, which you could fill out anything in there at all. Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples of that. You could have a search, background image or video, clear navigation, um, has all the elements that I have, I have already shown you in terms of how I would lay out a website. So again, this is a WordPress theme. Tour pages within this WordPress theme are incredible. Clean layouts, booking platform at the side. Again, this could, could be inquiry only. Uh, you can you have full customization in terms of how you want to take these bookings, etc. Um, and the good thing about this theme is it works in two ways. You can connect it um, using um, uh, a booking platform's web widgets to embed uh, an existing booking platform into this theme, um, or this theme does actually allow you to take bookings internally. So it does have its own internal booking calendar availability calendar, allows you to set up different products, allows you to set up payments within this, so you wouldn't even need to pay the commission to a booking platform. The only thing you would need to pay is the roughly the, the two and a half or three percent that you pay to PayPal or Stripe or Authorize.net. It works with a few other payment gateways as well. But this can actually handle your online booking platforms as well, uh, and your online, online bookings. The only downside to it is it won't connect to OTAs. That's one of the downsides to it. But if you weren't bothered about that, then it is a viable option, but it can still connect to other booking platforms as well. So what this has is it has availability calendar, allows you to edit the booking forms down the sides or the, the booking widgets. You can use it to set up multiple deposits and give people options. So it offers that type of functionality. Uh, and can I just say before I continue that we haven't built this theme, that we don't make money from this theme. Uh, this is just one that we've found that we've used for our own customers because we love it. Uh, it's such a great theme. So what I'm showing you here has got nothing to do with us. Someone else has built this, so I just wanted to put that out there. You can create custom packages, whether it's one day, two day, three day, whether it's one room, two room, three room. You can create all that within the system. Again, it can handle all the availability. You can take deposit payments and set whatever those depo deposits up. It can take group bookings and you set up group bookings, group discounts. So if you have... You can have it set so if you have more than five people booking at one time, you get a 10% discount or whatever it is you want to add. You can set all that within the system as well. 
you can set out, send out group messaging. So what this theme actually allows is for your customers to have a login area. They can log in, see previous bookings uh, or, or, or past bookings, yes, and ex existing bookings. Allows them to pay any remaining deposits and invoices and book like, uh, sorry, a wish list and, and bookmark uh, other things that they like. You can send out auto reminders to take payments, uh, send out invoices. Um, tour type and timings, you can set up do you want to offer your product only set days or set times or all the time or whatever? You can set all that up again within the system. Offer flexible pricing options, connects to PayPal or Stripe, authorized.net, PayMill, and it also has powerful search tools within it as well. Um, so that theme has all of that built in. Now, when we were developing websites, we would, for all the functionality that this has, with its own booking system and its own availability calendar, we would have easily charged 12, 15, 20,000 pounds for something like this, um, built from scratch. Um, so it's the fact that they can offer this for what they're offering it for is incredible. And I hope you're sitting down for this. It is $65 for that theme. For that WordPress theme, you'll only need to pay $65. Yes, you need to pay someone who knows a little bit about WordPress to install that theme and maybe set it up for you. You can do that for a few hundred pounds um, to do that for you. But ultimately, if to get all that functionality, <coughs> excuse me, and have a theme that is design-wise and great. It, has actually, it actually does come with other design options as well, so you can have different looks. It's only $65. So I'm just going to take a wee drink. My throat's going up. <coughs> excuse me. So it's only $65. It's incredible, incredible value. So this is why it does not cost the earth to build a website. You could pay a developer, you could pay someone to uh, get across this theme. So you can drive those direct bookings. But yes, um, I just see the question there. It does not link to OTA calendars. So this is if you're having your own internal system. You still need to use an external OTA or go through the, o the OTAs direct if you want to have something on the, those platforms. But if you're not worried about OTAs and you want to have a direct booking and, and use a booking system within this theme, that allows you to do that. But as I say, if you were using an external booking system or reservation system, you can embed their widgets and their calendars into this theme. So it does do that as well. So if you were using an external booking system that did link to OTAs, you can embed that into this theme. So you can use all the other functionality in terms of the search, in terms of the look of it, et cetera, et cetera. You just won't use its internal booking system. You just can't use its login area for customers because that's all tied in together with the booking platform within its internal system. But if you're happy with the look and happy with everything else and the search functionality and all that side of things, you can then still link that to an OTA if you're using the external booking platform. So here's a couple of examples. This is two of our clients, Mosel Travel and Overland Island, using the same theme. One's got a video, one's got an image. You can see the trust bar there on one. It's more about here's our reviews, no, there are expert local guides, that type of thing, whatever they want to have across as their USPs. The other one, we've actually got in a widget that pulls in their TripAdvisor reviews. It's like a little carousel that shows all the TripAdvisor reviews, 136 reviews. They've just been given the Traveler's Choice Award. All that's in there. So you can make the, the theme look a little bit different in terms of colors. Obviously, your content, your fonts, the ultimate layout stays the same. You can move things about, move elements around. It's a very good theme for doing that. So you can basically build pages to look a little bit different. Uh, but ultimately, the theme is really easy to use. It's, it's incredible, and it's only $65. And there's a hotel version as well. No, that theme can actually be used for accommodation, but there's a specific one for hotels as well called Hotels Ante, and that's $64. Again, allows you to set up you know, rooms and taking availability calendars and everything else. You can see there, you set up your when things are available, not available, allow your customers to select those features. All that is available just now for little money. So whether you're going through or creating a website through a booking platform for free, whether you're using something like this, there is no excuse not to have a really high-end, great-looking, feature-rich website anymore. The budget is there. For $65, yes, you maybe need to pay a few hundred pounds to have someone install this and set it up for you if you're not okay with WordPress. But once it's done, it's done. And it's yours. It's your website.
and then you can expand on it and build upon it and everything else from there. So that is what's available now. That is one of the reasons why I sold my website business. It's one of the reasons why we now use this theme for helping some of our customers who have terrible websites and they want to improve their websites. We use this theme a lot for, for those customers as well. So this is why creating a good website like this will help drive direct bookings, will help create you a better foundation of becoming, from what I said at the very start, to become that media company that I originally said. That is ultimately how you're going to drive direct bookings. As I say, don't forget about OTAs. Just don't rely so heavily on them. And having a great looking website, looking at becoming a media company, looking at the content you could be putting out there for free just now or spending little on Facebook ads and budget just now, but you can do that. You can drive that now because this is a prime time to do that when the OTAs are hurting at the moment. You know, there's less travel happening. But you could be gaining traction on them and on, on, on other businesses just now by getting marketing out there by doing it for free or spending very, very little on it. Do it now. Refine your website. Now is a great time to build a new website if you want to and using something like this. Refine it. Get your booking platforms, whether it's external or using an internal one like this. Now is the time to do it. So it will set you up for when th things do get better and things uh, improve over, hopefully over the next five to six months. That is when you'll be at a stronger position. You'll, you'll have all the key elements in place that you will be able to focus more on direct uh, than not. So in summary, um, uh, just to cover what we've covered here, direct bookings, in my opinion, are the only way to survive uh, and to give you a better chance of survival during a crisis. Uh, I just, and to become a, a business that you, that you, you are your own business, basically. The OTAs are important, but try not to have as much as, or, or any more than 20% or thereabouts of your revenue generated by them. That may take time, especially if you are heavily reliant, but keep plugging away at the direct channels. And then as that's improving, well, you can then tip that balance and be, have more direct than you can do in terms of OTAs. And as I say, you have no excuse now for not having a great looking website and the booking platform. So even if you did not want to use an external platform, again, you can use a theme like that that has its internal one. Or if you did use an external platform, you can still use a theme like that um, and go to whoever it is you want to use for external platforms for your booking and reservation systems and embed that into it. Um, and that will give you the best of both worlds as well. So as I say, no excuse. Focus on the direct. Don't forget about OTAs. Don't forget about that, those channels, but just don't rely heavily on them. Uh, and I guarantee you, but it will take time, but I guarantee you, you will come out with a stronger business going forward. Uh, and, a, and a business you could probably be more proud of because you know that hard work and, and, uh, and the things that you put in there within your own marketing and all these other things that you put in yourself, you know that the revenue you've been generated is through your own efforts and not through an OTA that you're competing against. But an OTA is going to list other companies on there as well and you're always vying for that uh, uh, position on, on OTAs. So direct is always a way to go in my opinion, uh, especially now with what Google's trying to do, the way the industry is moving, um, local, more local and domestic, that is where um, direct travel is, uh, direct bookings is certainly going to be the biggest one going forward. So hope that gave you a lot of information, although there was a lot to take in in that. Um, I wanted to leave, you know, we're now reached close to the hour and a half mark, I wanted to leave enough time for questions for people. Um, just to inform you of the next, next week's workshop, Hopefully my voice will be come back by that point. Um, there'll be, next one is all gonna be on video marketing. I'm gonna show you some great examples of good videos, how you can create videos, the tools that you can use to create videos, and then how you can basically create one campaign, one video, and create roughly 100 days worth of content from that to sort of show you that once you've done something and you've done it, then you have like, you can literally post out one a day onto different channels and you have 100 days worth of content with different touch points, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I'm gonna show in that one. And then after that, it'll be the, the power of Facebook. More on Facebook ads, the more on how we approach Facebook ads, showing you some real life examples, the methodology behind it. Um, I think that, that'll be quite an exciting one for you guys to see. So we'll be going through, I think the next, these two next workshops are going to be a little bit more practical, a little bit more showing you how to do these things, a little bit showing you what to do on these platforms and how you can drive direct bookings through both of these methods. So hopefully you can join me uh, in those workshops as well. So I hope that was okay. I hope you got enough information from that. Uh, hopefully there'll be some questions you can come in and you can answer. And uh, yeah, I uh, hope that was 
for that. I hope, I hope you got something from it. <laughs> Chris, that was epic. Literally, there's so much in there. Um, and just one, just one question, like uh, Columbo there. Uh, Scott from Kogaliki Lodge, um, what is your opinion on having separate pricing for OTAs higher than direct on your own website? That is a very, very good question. I th I'm glad you brought it up. <clears throat> so, excuse my throat a little bit. But, um, I personally think, yes, you should have your prices higher on an OTA to compensate for uh, the commissions and things like that you pay. Yeah. However, um, a lot of these OTAs now, like Viator um, and a few others, have it in their clause that you are not allowed to have your price on your website or any other channel cheaper than theirs. Mm -hmm. So OTAs are actually putting handcuffs behind your back to say, mm -hmm. okay, you can be on our platform, but you cannot have them dearer. We have to be the we have to be either the same price or cheaper. So you so have you to look have to at be, small print in your OTAs. Yeah, you have to be pretty careful about it, don't you? Um, yeah. La last one, Lucy. Uh, I have a question for the end, please. To be able to display Facebook reviews on website, how do I access Facebook Business Manager for my self-catering Facebook page? I think I set a tag for receiving reviews in the Business Manager. I find Business Manager a complete nightmare. It's bamboozlingly complex for the for the smaller business, I think. Yeah, the it's a good question. Um, no, unless you know how to use Business Manager, it can be a minefield. Facebook... Um, for, for once of a better word, change, change the look of Facebook every so often and they move things around and everything else and it's a bit of a pain. But if I was personally you, I would not focus on Facebook reviews. Facebook don't really have a review system anymore. It's more recommendations. Um, although it still can come under reviews, they don't, they don't classic reviews. If you're going to focus on any review system, always focus on Google. I would have people direct them to Google and have people leave reviews there. It's more, they carry more weight um, through SEO. They carry more weight yep. through other means as well. They're more trusted. I would focus on Google reviews rather than Facebook reviews. Spot on. You have, uh, well, I see that uh, Lisa says that her pen ran out. Uh, my battery is about <laughs> to go in my headset. So um, <laughs> I guess we will wrap up. I have a couple of things just to, to mention. So, so the first one you talked about, um, the narrative of the blog, the speak to people in your natural language and, and tell that story. Um, one of the things that we are uh, going to be doing in the next uh, six, seven, eight weeks is a virtual fam trip. So a virtual destination fam trip uh, with our partners at UK Inbound. Uh, so mm -hmm. everyone on the call today, think about how we can showcase your business to uh, inbound tour operators without them being here. So, for example, Lisa um, at Dolphins, you know, how can we showcase Dolphins remotely? Uh, perhaps Julia at the Clooney Bank there, how can we showcase the, the Clooney Bank? Um, Caroline, uh, Lucy, or Howard, the self-catering operators, the uh, boutique, boutique accommodation, how can we showcase your accommodation? So good images, content, copy, anything that you can give to us, we can showcase to our travel trade partners. So that's point one. Uh, point two, this is really important for me. Uh, we've done a little quick and dirty survey which we would love it if the people on this call could complete for us in the next day or so, just to ask you what you think the next few months of our support package could look like and should look like. So what do you need from us and what do you want us to do? Um, and thirdly, it's only a hundred days till Christmas. So <laughs> that's not because I like Christmas. Anybody that knows me will know I hate it. Um, but let's start thinking Christmas packages. Let's start thinking, what are your plans? Uh, because we will have a campaign month by month by month leading up to Christmas and beyond. So um, if you give it to us, we can take it to the world. So think about your offer for Christmas. If you're open, what are you doing? How can we take your offer to a wider audience? So virtual fam trip, business survey. I'll send a link to you guys in the next hour or two. Uh, think about Christmas. And we will see you, Chris, in a week's time. <laughs>